Hi, hello and welcome to another episode of, well, The War on China. Welcome to my channel, Fermuve and Mario Cavolo, The Dragon Roar Song. We are waiting for Mario to come onto the live stream and give us his update on what is taking place at the 7 China Globalization Forum live stream uh, part Too. So while we wait for him, let me tell you some of the things that I, I did this morning. This morning, I was talking to um, a relatively new YouTuber. Um, his channel is Journey and Destination. And we had a very long chat talking about, well, all the things that Western people say and uh, think uh, are true about China in the West. Um We had a very lengthy conversation that he is going to publish very soon. And, uh, well, one of the things that he wanted to know was about why, it, why is it with the media uh, saying all these things that they say that are actually not true. And this is one of the reasons why I'm waiting for um, Mario to actually join us because he was taking part in the third round table at um, this meeting in Beijing, the CCG meeting, which is the Center for China and Globalization. They have this annual meeting. This is number seven. As a member, uh, a fellow of the CCG, Mario was invited to actually speak during this round table, which was about media and communication. It's one of the questions that a lot of people um, ask and wonder, what can China do? How can China interact better with media to um, will change the narrative and to, to improve the way that people see China and, and hear and read China. So it's, it's very important to hear what not only Mario had to say, what other people had to say in terms of the message that media companies from the West are sending from within China. This relates a lot to what we saw Um, the BBC do, and as I learned furthermore, um, the Deutsche Welle. The situation with this um, German uh, reporter who was caught in Zhengzhou, um, and he was mistaken for the BBC reporter, Mr. Brandt. The interesting thing is that there are now clips showing what this uh, German reporter was actually saying, and it was very similar to what the BBC per person was reporting. As you remember, um, this reporter, Mr. Brandt, he was saying that um, many Chinese people have been left to die in the unfortunate incident of the flooding of the subways in Zhengzhou uh, during the once in a century um, uh, storms um, where they saw a whole year worth of rain drop in a matter of a day. So no system, no city is uh, designed to take that much water. And this particular reporter had the audacity to, to say and express himself that way, that people were left to die in the... Um, in the subway. That, that is just a very sad incident. And it's also very sad to know that that's how they tried to report what took place in Genjo. The thing with this um, German reporter was that he was doing something very similar. Reports have shown that he was also talking about how the government was responsible for a poor response. All you could see on social media here in China was people doing everything they could to help, doing everything they could to improve the situation, to rescue people, to reach people that were, well, in a difficult situation. You don't have to go too far. You could see, for example, Jad from Nio, Jaya, Matt from Jaya Nation, um, when his uh, city, where he is in Nimbo, was also flooded. This climate change is really affecting the world. And uh, we're going to see more and more of these situations because according to uh, experts, my brother, one of them, uh, we seem to have reached a point of no return. So we need to get used to a new normal. So this uh, German reporter basically was saying that <laughs> he was saying that the government had not 
done enough, that the government had actually um, could be guilty, could be blamed for the poor um, response. All right, uh, Mario is now on my server, so I'm going to click and bring him into the stream, and we can see what he has to say. Uh, Mario, how are you? Fernando, I'm doing great, and I'm just getting on with you, and I'm sorry I'm a little bit late. I'm doing fantastic, and just I'm going to also be adjusting a little bit while I'm just getting on the stream with you. Hey, everybody. No how problem. You doing? <laughs> Hope everybody's doing fantastic. I'm doing great, and uh, it's been a fantastic and important day as well, right? Uh, mm. Please, again, hold on. Let me get situated and adjusted. Yes, I mean, I was telling our audience and our viewers yeah, that um, we are all very interested to know um, what your speech was about, because I've been asking you, as you said, like, I'm not going to tell you, I'm not going to tell you. I, <laughs> now, I'm really interested to know what your speech was about and also what other people were saying during that meeting, during that uh, third round table, the media and communications round table. Um, so if you're all set, uh, do you think you could share something with us? Good. Um, am I all set? My audio is good, Fernando. And, you look and beautiful, with, man. You uh, look sharp. <laughs> and oh, di different from when we did our episode together when I was in my bathrobe at the at the at the the, the hot springs resort. Different uh, than that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no bathroom this time. <laughs> okay, I got it. So uh, thanks so much, Fernando. And uh, again, great to be here with everyone. Uh, I'm live on the ground in Beijing at the uh, China World Summit uh, wing, which actually is a Shangri-La hotel property, which is beautiful. And I love Shangri-La. I love the Shangri-La brand in China. Um, in 2000 and what was it? 2012, 13, uh, my, my company's offices were at the Shangri-La Kerry Hotel in Pudong in Shanghai. Um, I had offices in the business center and lots of cooperation every day with the hotel. Uh, it's a great hotel brand, and uh, here we are again. So we're in the ballroom area. Obviously, this is the, again, Center for China and Globalization, seventh annual forum. Um, my honor, I'm delighted to be here. It's my first CCG event. Uh, uh, President Wang mentioned to me that I'm the only person from outside of Beijing that they invited to come in uh, and invited me to be a speaker on Roundtable 3, which I did. Now, you asked what uh, what I talked about, uh, that's classified. I can't tell you. You'd be accused of being a spy for China. Nah, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but what I was talking about is not important, that important at all. So I don't want to spend a lot of time on that because there's people all around me who are luminaries um, who've spoken, very, very distinguished people. And I'll share a little bit with you what, what they all had to say. For myself, we were, you know, our whole, our whole particular panel, I'll mention in a minute. Let me go back, please, and uh, refer back to roundtable number two earlier, Fernando, which related to you. Um, roundtable number two was with respect to uh, Liu Xin, who is the arguably most famous uh, news host in, uh, in China, uh, the host of her show, Liu, uh, The Point with Liu Xin, and other shows as well. So she was the... Uh, chair for roundtable number two, which was with all of the ambassadors of China. And that was fascinating. And you'd mentioned to me that you had met the uh, Diego Monsalve, Ambassador Diego Monsalve, who mm -hmm. was the ambassador to Colombia. And of course, you yourself are a Colombiano. And so <laughs> I made the effort. I was very, very pleased. And I'm very happy to share with you, first of all, Again, because it was my first live event in Beijing, and I got to meet all these wonderful people face to face. So I've been on Liu Xin's show three times, uh, but it was always via satellite up in the Shenyang studio in, in Shenyang and uh, CGTN studio. And I got to meet her face to face today. It was wonderful. And at, this, at the end of that roundtable, too, with the ambassadors, I caught Liu Xin, and no more than two meters away was Ambassador. Monsalve, Monsalve. <laughs> and boom, I got him. I walked right up to him. 
he remembered you immediately wow. from having met from having met you at the CRI event last year, as you told me in 2020. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, I'm happy to share this with you. And then Ambassador Salve sends his warmest regards to my amigo Fernando Munoz. Yeah, so, <laughs> very, very nice. Fantastic. Um, um, yeah. And then as far as what he said during the during his his uh, his talk uh, during his roundtable, you know, he talked about the fact that in fact Colombia was quite successful in its rollout of the vaccines and controlling the pandemic. And then as well, he's certainly continuing to push for Colombia. Uh, a lot of people do recognize some quite strong uh, elements, uh, infrastructure and economic elements that are in Colombia, uh, which make it more and more attractive um, for international companies. He talked about some of those aspects as well. Yeah, yeah. It, there's just quite a few challenges that that Colombia is experiencing. In, in general, Latin America is experiencing. Um, yeah, we know that. But I, I, I think that everybody at that roundtable agrees that China's leadership role is, is going to play a very important role this century, this this decade, basically. And yeah. eyes on Latin America are very important, not only for natural resources and win-win cooperation, but for stability. Um, it's, it's a continent, a subcontinent, if you, if you will, um, that is prone to a lot of instability and um, good leadership, good support, uh, good cooperation and a, a, a proper north would be very beneficial for the whole Latin American countries. Uh, so I think that um, to see them at this round table sharing their their, their hopes, their dreams, and what they could bring to the table in terms of globalization and China's growth and development is extremely valuable. I, I, I saw um, little bits of what he was saying, and he was talking about, for example, oil exploration. You got Venezuela being a huge oil producer, but then you've oh, got yeah. Colombia as well. Um, and we are the only Latin American, sorry, South American country, I clarify, with coast on both oceans, the Atlantic and the Caribbean. So uh, we, we are just ripe for proper, proper um, import-export uh, cooperation with a huge country like China. So it's, uh, it's something that I always follow with great interest whenever he, he well, Dr. Monsalve posts something uh, related to trade and, and increased cooperation between Colombia and China. To me, that's extremely, extremely pleasant to see to hear you and bet. also also very satisfying to see these two countries coming together and i mean it very sincerely when i say i've always wanted to be go to colombia you know i've heard nothing but good things i mean again i know there's the challenges in certain areas there's high crime etc but besides that i've heard great things and i want to go there and and uh experience that culture and it's on my bucket list as they say you know mm -hmm. um <laughs> So what else? What else do you want me to jump to right now? What would you like well, me to I would, jump to? I would to? like to. I would like to know about? a little bit what um, what other people from media and communication shared. I mean, um, yes, you bet. One of the questions. One of the questions that our audience have and that I myself have is, what is the future of media in China, both international media with everything that we are seeing taking place, the FCC accusing China of of not protecting journalists, um, or or this jump from Chinese media into international sphere, producing shows in English like Liu Xing's The Point, like Dialogue, et cetera, et cetera, CDTN, CRI, all these English channels that are producing information content originated from China in you English. How, how is that going to shape media and information in the future? Uh, were any of these points addressed uh, at, any, at any time? Yeah, they all were, and, and by a number of people. I'm going to take it in an order. I've got four particular comments for you, and you know, all the business cards of the people that I met and shared the panel with today was been a great day for me. So, for example, I'm uh, sitting to my left was uh, uh, Jin Mai. Jin Mai is the senior China reporter for South China Morning Post now. All right, you're breaking up a little bit, Mario. Um, you're talking I'm about South China Morning Post. He was sitting to your left. Sorry, what was that? Yeah, and I'm and I'm back. Right here, I am. Yeah. I'm back. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Good. Yes. Uh, and you know, he talked about the fact that uh, Chinese media, you know, 
they do a good job of highlighting what's unique about China, but they don't do a good job of being empathetic. And, and the international media is much better at being empathetic and enabling, mes you know, sharing messaging that is more about shared values and empathetic to the readers to understand, you know, hey, here's what we're experiencing in China. And it, that's similar to what you're experiencing and who you are in your country. You know, sharing values and sharing humanity. Uh, rather than trying to sell, you know, well, no, 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 we're not that. We're we're this. We're that. We're that. You know, it's just more competitive uh, and reactionary views, you know, coming out of Chinese media, and it's tough. And my comment to him was that a lot of it is the cultural barrier. I mean, you're talking about, you know, Chinese people. Even they know a little bit of English or a decent amount of English, but they. They've never, if they didn't live overseas, they don't, really don't know what the Western world and Western thinking is like. I mean, it's really, really different. And the cultural and language barriers are a big part of it. So it's not a question of saying blaming Chinese media, but recognizing that, you know, these are where the challenges, these are where the weaknesses lie. Um, I went on to my right and a completely different point of view. This is uh, uh, Huang Renwei, Professor, uh, Professor Huang, who is the executive dean at Fudan University's Fudan Institute, specifically for, uh, with respect to the Belt and Road and Global Governance Initiative. So this guy is uh, an older gentleman and full of detailed knowledge about what's really happening with the Belt and Road Initiative and how, you know, the Belt and Road Initiative, Again, it needs to provide messaging that more clearly and more accurately shares what Belt and Road Initiative is all about. So when Belt and Road Initiative, he used an example, he used the example of Pakistan. He said that uh, when you know, the Belt and Road came out, then the West immediately created a narrative to negatively counter that. And the narrative that they immediately came up with to counter the Belt and Road Initiative, which is otherwise wildly and insanely successful, was debt trap. It's a debt trap. And they started making these accusations. But again, as I've said to you, all of, all of our, the people who watch our shows, um, it's a false, non-demonstrable, assertoric, rhetoric accusation. And... He talked about, as an example, there's articles that talk about $30 billion of debt with respect to Pakistan's, uh, Pakistan, there's 30 mil billion U.S. dollars of debt, um, and this is to do with Pakistan. Oh, there's a debt trap. And then he said, but, but the, the you know, financial newspaper who does this article failed to break down and note the detail. And they always do that, right? They don't mention, they, they leave out the detail. Okay, mm. they generalization, there's three ways that the media fools you and deceives you and lies to you and manipulates you, ladies and gentlemen. They generalize, they delete, and they distort. And in this case, they deleted. What did they delete? <laughs> Only 20% of the 30 billion US dollars is actual Pakistan government debt that they took on. The other, and 70% of the debt 70% of the 30 billion is debt of Chinese companies who invested in Pakistan. So it's the, the debt is not held by Pakistan. It's held by Chinese companies who are in Pakistan. That's not debt to Pakistan. It's debt to Chinese companies, you know? Yeah. And so, oops, oops, $24 million, $24 billion mistake, you know? <laughs> So stuff like that. Right. So, so that was Huang Ren Wei. And then the other one, uh, a very distinguished gentleman on our panel, in fact, Philip Kisre, who is uh, the country leader for China for Wiley and Sons Publishing. And he immediately talked about the fact that uh, the story needs to be more effectively sent out to the world of how much and the focus needs to be on how much China is absolutely contributing to the world and doing so in almost 
every arena and field of industry and academics that you could possibly imagine. China is contributing so much to the world. And so focus on telling the story of what China is doing to contribute to the world. Now, number one, the West blunts those stories. But number two, China's not doing a good enough job of getting those stories out. You know, we know what a couple of those stories are, right? I mean, how, which country on planet Earth has supplied the world with uh, 350, 400 million vaccine doses? You know, mm. China, right? I mean, it's just it's incredible. And no other country is even close to that, right? We're, um, we're up to 700 million vaccines that have been provided I'm so sorry. by China we're to other to countries. 700 million. To, yeah. Excuse me, where have I been? I, you know, I quoted an old number. <laughs> yeah. So that, that's a really good example. And, and, and let's see, what else? Um, oh, uh, yeah. I'll, I was on I'll make a short, a short comment. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I know that you were interviewed. We were supposed to do episode number two after lunch. I set it up and some people were no. waiting. And then you were called for some interviews. So we apologize to our audience. I that was my I bad. Apologize. That was my bad. Um, but I wanted to make a very, very short comment on, on what you're saying. And I think that what, what um, the South China Morning Post person was saying is that China has been busy correcting a narrative. The United Thank States you. says, oh, China does this, oh, China does that. And like, no, it's not like this, no, it's not like that. What China needs to do is to start creating the narrative, creating the content that other countries are going to react to. So you have the stories to do so space station, semiconductors, like the largest this and the greatest Plenty that. And you have all the stories to, to create the narrative and set aside all this correction of narrative, which is basically uh, what they're trying to do. They're trying to play defense. Stop thinking about that and push forward to create your own story, the story that people are going to follow and react to. Now, the second thing that you mentioned that I think is very important when it comes to the Belt and Road Initiative is the image that people have, of course, is, yes, it's a debt trap, but there's also an aspect of hegemony. They think that China is pursuing world domination. It's imperialistic. It, this is a, a hegemonic endeavor. The Belt and Road Initiative is nothing but going back to the grandiose history of the Silk Road, of, of the, the superb trade routes that China had. Yes, Mario? I think you're, I, I don't want to say I think you're right and wrong about what you just said. I don't mean it that way. Mm. Yes, but to a I can't believe I'm going to say this, but I mean it in a dis in a in a discussionary way. I no, I do think that they're after a bit of hegemony. Mm -hmm. <laughs> can't believe I'm saying that, right? I'm like, wait a minute. So, but but there's a difference, okay? Um, there was the European expansion, he hegemonic expansion across the world, from as we know, as Europe came into the Renaissance out of the Dark Ages and then began exploring uh, and expanding across the world. Uh, and that was the European hegemony. And a lot of good came from that. Let's not kid ourselves, okay? That was the world's first globalization. That was a pretty cool thing. And a lot of really good stuff came from that. However, and you know what the however is, it was mm. accompanied by brutal, violent war colonization, mm. okay? So that was the bad part of it. It was always accompanied by brutal, violent war. They often made it happen that way, okay, and oppression. Now, that came to an end because those idiots in Europe decided to start blowing each other up. You know, you start blowing up your neighbors during World War I and decimating your own continent. I mean, that's just like the dumbest historical thing I've ever heard in my life, and that's what they did. You know, and then and then the, and then and then and then the reparations after World War One pissed off Germany because they were too harsh. And then Hitler came along and said, "No, we're not going to put up with this stuff, and let's blame the Jews." And then now and you know then they started the into World War Two. Okay, so I mean Europe really just ruined themselves. I mean they just decimated themselves. They had no one to blame but themselves. Um, thankfully, that's in the past, and it gave rise to America's hegemony. 
And America's hegemony, more so than Europe, also has done. Look, look folks, I want to be very clear about this. you got to go back through the world and see how much good America has done across the world. Extremely generous. I'm not kidding you. I'm, I'm being historically, demonstrably, observably correct when I say this. However, two things. One, it was the past. They haven't been that way recently. This was the past. This was from World War II, the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s. This was America's time of rising and time of hegemony, and it did so much good for the world. And it did, and it's true, and it's in the historical record. With one exception, again, it was also accompanied by brutal warmongering. Okay? Mm -hmm. And so that part of it was bad. Um, and they've killed millions of people along the way. Okay. So now we have, now we get to the year 2000 and China's rise. And we get to around uh, 2008 and nine when, again, that was the halfway point of the United States declining, uh, its political decline, economic decline, and uh, into the financial crisis which accelerated China's rise mm. through 2015. It, so, you know, the, the, the Western powers shoot themselves in the foot. They actually accelerated China's rise, okay? And now, and then from 2015 around, I don't remember the exact date, China then turned around and announced this old Silk Road, the revival of the old Silk Road. We're gonna say, we're gonna bypass, we're not, gonna go, we're not gonna go this way, we're gonna go mm. this way. We got to go through through Xinjiang. Uh, we're on the we got rail now, the Euro China rail, all the way through Xinjiang, and it's amazing because it's doing huge amounts of yeah, huge amounts of you know tons tons of shipping. It's going all the way through to Europe from China. The the new Silk Road by maritime and by rail, as we know, and this is fantastic. So. But it is also their, their outreach. This is their big hegemonic move. They were, they're gaining economic power all across the world. Come on, man. No, sure. I mean, I, and, think, I think that it's important the one difference, to, to differentiate. Yes. Uh, it's important to differentiate um, how you get this hegemony. You can either get it yeah, without through, war. through leadership. Exactly, through, through leadership. I mean, think about Ukraine. Ukraine, which was trying to deal with Trump and trying to figure out how to, okay, how do we get some help? And now Ukraine is saying like, okay, let's talk Beijing because this might be useful for us. This must be, this might be beneficial for us. Look at Afghanistan. Just the Taliban just came to talk to the foreign minister in Beijing three days ago, two days ago. And, and, yeah. and things yeah. are starting to move in a direction that is very beneficial to China. But this is hegemony through leadership. It's very different when you have hegemony through imposition, war, through yeah, war, thank you. through yeah. through through power. So that is the biggest difference, and perhaps that's what I what I meant to say. Yes, yeah. not by China death traps, not by war. China is getting hegemony, but through a different kind of approach, an approach that's just based on. Do you guys want to follow our model? Do you Making guys deals. Want to hop on this train. Do you guys want to just revitalize your economies and connect your economies the way we're doing? Yeah. If, if, if you want, you're more than welcome to join us. It's extremely yeah. different. And um, in that sense, um, I think that that's, that's one of the messages that hasn't been sent properly by, by Chinese media, that the BRI yeah. is a business, it's a business it's program. Business. It's, it's business, bit, thank you. Basically. It's make it's make a deal. It's not by war, mm -hmm. and it's not by oppression, and it's not by debt trap diplomacy. It is make not by those. Three, it's by make a deal. It's by China has always favored what has been said many times in the past, and I've always noticed this. China has always said, "Hey, bilateral relations, meaning between our country and your country, we make a deal. It's our mm -hmm. business." There's nothing wrong with that. I think it's terrific. It's it's yeah. all about globalization and globalization for all. It's not just globalization for for some powers that get right. to control all the supply chain or no, it's it's 
let's let's cooperate let's work together you'll benefit will benefit and everybody wins so that was my take on hegemony so yes you're right. probably right when you correct me now yeah. um, the other the other thing that that I wanted to to ask you about was um, this morning uh, which of the ambassadors uh, strikes you as um, more in tune with China more more connected and aligned with China's plans, intentions, and and aspirations. Uh, what would you? Who would you say you found was more in tune? Thank you for asking, and uh, I will give you the. Ex I will give you fifty percent of the exact answer, which is <laughs> the answer. Yeah, seriously, the answer is because I I don't have my notes in front of me, and I didn't actually write that down. Uh, without a doubt, there were two roundtables where the gentlemen who were uh, very experienced and were representing the EU, they were representing the EU, those guys knew exactly what they were talking about. However, his name's on the tip of my tongue, and I can't remember his name. And again, I don't have my book in front of me. I, don't, I didn't write it down. So I can't remember his name, and I didn't get a chance to shake his hand and get his business card, so I don't have it in my pile of business cards right here. So that's the, But that's the answer. The two guys that were represented the European Union during the earlier roundtables, they really understood the issues. They knew what was, they were. They spoke with clarity. It was obvious they spoke with so much clarity and confidence. It was very obvious. Because that's a that's a question that get asked quite a lot by the people who watch our channel, who watch our shows. They would say like, "Do the Western governments really understand China?" And you, yes. we are not in their shoes. We don't know if they do or they don't. But well, they do. guess, my guess is they do. Um, they do. Or it's just that they have different messages to send, right? Like, like, oh, China bad, but let's uh, expand the floor space of the Hong Kong American um, American Chamber of Commerce, or let's the invest more more millions and millions into uh, building batteries for Tesla in China. Like, <laughs> there's government talk, and then there's business talk, <laughs> and they they yes, seem to go at different levels. We we need to clarify very much because you've got the uh, it was was it Netherlands Parliament that that declared uh, you know they officially declared uh, genocide in in in, in Xinjiang, Xinjiang. Mm. which 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 is like the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. And then it was another Parliament was the UK. Uh huh. Okay, yeah, and then the, the third one and the third one was Canadian, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, thanks. So stop. No, let me finish the thought. I want everyone to understand that the people who declared that, it was unofficial by a small number of those constituents. The vast majority of people in the EU and the UK had, meaning politicians in power, had nothing to do with those vote sanction, those initiatives to vote for sanctions or official declarations, nonsense by a small number of antagonistic anti-China politicians. So you need to know that the vast majority of Europe is not on board with them. They were just, you know, doing their own independent thing as very much an activist minority, uh, probably paid behind the scenes by the United States to do so. So let's be clear about that. I remember the vote um, in in the UK Parliament, five people, seven people, <laughs> right. something like that. Right, and they exactly my point. <laughs> right. So this has um, nothing to do with what's happening in China and China EU business, which you know and I know, Fernando, and and everyone watching us knows. Do you you do understand that China EU trade and China US trade and, and all that all those numbers are up higher and growing. higher and higher and they keep just they keep, keep getting big from Come last on. year. So <laughs> baby, baby, everybody knows which side the bread is buttered on. Come on, give me a break. <laughs> well, the other thing that uh, I found interesting, and uh, I don't know if you had a chance to maybe took it over with people over there or just discuss it, but the fact that Wendy Sherman came here and didn't take the time to go to Xinjiang and check things for herself. It's really telling, um, if I oh, may express my opinion. Telling? If she goes there and she and she sees that 
the Muslims are not being prosecuted, that there's millions, 12 million Uyghurs living freely, happily, and uh, safely, well, some terrorists are in prison, the narrative is gone. The narrative is be, destroyed. Yeah. There's no more enemy to, to go after. So you got to ask yourself as our viewers, why didn't Wendy just hop on a plane to Urumqi to have a look? She could have asked. She could have gone. She chose not to. No, why, no, Wendy? no. Why? But <laughs> yes, why, when, why, why, Wendy? Why? And give me a double burger, Wendy. Uh, you're, you're right. You're right. <laughs> But you're all, but you're also being a little bit naive because you're forgetting one point of it, which mm -hmm. is to say that's a no-win situation. She was mm -hmm. Wendy, the what? What is she? De deputy, deputy secretary, or something? Yeah. Her title, deputy Coffee secretary. Girl. No, just kidding. She was. She no, 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 no. She's a respectable woman. Mm -hmm. uh, give her that. But but the very fact of who she was precluded the impossibility of her being able to go to Xinjiang because no matter. First of all, she couldn't go to Xinjiang because nobody would let her go to Xinjiang, meaning the U.S. side wouldn't let her mm -hmm. go. Because yeah. then, like you said, that would blow their narrative. But it was a waste of the time from the Chinese point of view to even say to her, hey, we insist you go to Xinjiang, because no matter what the United States side would say, and the public diaspora supporting the United States would say, oh, they let her go to Xinjiang, but obviously they're not going to let her see what they don't want her to see, rendering the entire trip to Xinjiang a complete waste of time. And everybody knew that mm -hmm. in advance. So let's be and blunt. Think, let's be honest. Now, hang on. Oh, go, all right, go yeah. ahead. Go ahead. No, go in, ahead. A sense, in a sense, uh, this goes back to the reacting to the narrative. I mean, Chinese people are way, way smarter than a lot of people give them credit for. They understand that that's the narrative and that's yeah. not going to change yeah. with her visit. Whatever Precisely. she does, says and sees is anyway going to be twisted and turned against China uh, as something, oh, this uh, invalidates the trip and whatever she saw or said she saw um, doesn't that's really right. count because this hey. and this and this and that. So you're right. Show. It was probably, hey. Show, show. I want to show the viewers the real world of China. This is classic. This is the... This is the VIP room here at the Shangri-La for the CCG event. And of course, everybody's in the everybody's watching roundtable number four. I cut out to do our show together. And this is it, right? This is a classic Chinese VIP room here at the Shangri-La Hotel for all the VIPs that were allowed to come in here. So I, I wanted to show everybody that it looks really, really cool. Um, I, I want to point out one other thing about Wendy that you just that you just mentioned. I'm I'm getting my phone back up where. There we go. Uh, I want to point out one more thing about the situation with, Sher with Wendy Sherman and the American. Uh, I, I didn't bring the brochure with me. There's 400 people here. Mm -hmm. There's ambassadors of China from all over the world. There's ministerial and, you know, the World Bank, the director of the World Bank, uh, mm -hmm. ASEAN, uh, uh, countless numbers of, you know, presidents, vice presidents, CEOs of Fortune 500 companies and representatives from all over the world are here with the, the OECD, the, the, the or Development Bank, with, and on and on and on. They're all here. And you know who's not here? Nobody from America. Wendy Sherman's not here. Blinken's you know? not there. Yeah, no, <laughs> nobody from the United... No, there's no, no United States here. And it, we're, we're all discussing what's happening all over the world. <laughs> this is not this is not a China forum. This is a conference about what's happening with China throughout the entire developed and developing world. And the one major party that's not here or any representative of the major party that's not here is the United States. They're not here. They're just oh, they're not involved. It's like they're okay. just busy whipping up trouble. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Mario. On that yeah. note of absence mm. from the United States from such an important event, it's important mm. to remind people that Mario Cavolo, a fellow member yeah. <laughs> of the Center for yeah. China and Globalization, was actually talking to all these dignitaries, to all these ambassadors, to all these CEOs, to all I these uh, representatives. So if they listen to Mr. Mario Cavolo, you do you do a good job by listening to what he has to say here and what we have to say here in our show, Mario. Um, I'm gonna let you finish your coffee. I'm gonna let you finish your 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 fourth round. Go check out what that is about. And um, yeah, we're good. Well, we want to say thank you to everyone who tuned up uh, 
basically without much warning, yeah. with much antelation. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for commenting and for chatting. And um, well, remember to give this video a like, share it, let people know what's actually taking place here in China from a position of power. <gasps> I just said what Wendy said. <laughs> yeah. All right. Friends, bye, thank everyone you so much. From Until we see bye, you again. everyone. Bye -bye. Yeah. See you. Bye-bye from on the ground in Beijing.